Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. He loves us so much. So much. Mm. We're going to be celebrating the Lord's table today, but we're going to do it at the end of the message. Because I would like the Word of God to, um, I have a bit of um, echo here, Uh, I would uh, uh, like the Word of God to do a work in us before we go to the table, amen? So that when we're going to the table, we are receiving the way God would want us to receive it. We are continuing this this teaching of living in the spirit. Last week we looked at the carnal mind versus the peaceful mind. And we, we first in this series said, well, we need to be born of God. We need to be made new by God. Christianity is not something I can think myself into. It's something that God gives power. He gives the ability to become his child. And he makes a new creation. He makes our spirit new. We become born again. And then we learn that even though we become born again, we have to realize that there is a carnal mind and there is a spiritual mind. And we went through that if you want to have a mind of peace, if you want to live with peace, if you want a deep, strong, solid peace, it's more than just thinking a few thoughts that are positive. It's about walking in a wholeness. It's where, it's, in Hebrew, the word is shalom. Nothing broken, nothing lacking. It's fully, wonderfully complete in him. And so in order to do that, we need to not just understand that there are two minds. We need to know how to live according to the mind of Christ. So as I shared last time, I uncovered the problem and declared the solution, but now we're going to talk about how. Amen? Because if you, if you know what, but you don't know how, then, well, you're just aware, but not necessarily victorious. What I'm going to share with you today is not complicated, and praise God for that. Praise God that it isn't intricate and complicated, but it is deep. A lot of things in the scripture, uh, like the blood of Jesus, like the body of Jesus, communion, the Lord's Supper, it is deep, but it's not complicated. And so much of the scripture is presented that way. Even parables are not complicated, but they're deep. Jesus taught in a parabolic method, meaning that he, he brought stories and illustrations. And it was up to the heart of the person if they would be able to understand it. So it isn't about how intellectual we are. It is about how pure our heart is bowed to Jesus. This will always be the difference. This is why children are able to understand the deep things of God, but they don't have doctorates. And God is looking for the children to accept him like little children. Isn't that beautiful? I don't expect my children, especially when they were babies, I don't expect them to understand the intricacies of what I know, but I want them to know my love. And I want them, when I walk into the door, to run to me and say, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And they understand things that their little mouths can't even express properly. But they understand it in the heart. Christianity is like that. We have to get understanding in the heart. (coughs) Excuse me. Paul the Apostle, uh, let's go there in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. The mind of the spirit, the spiritual mind... And we're going to be talking about that today. The spiritual mind is 
not something that can be measured by an IQ test. Praise God, somebody should say. Some of us should say, hallelujah. It's not a standardized SAT class. Praise the Lord. Right? It is not the measurement of your intellect. It's a measurement of our humility, of our brokenness to desire him, our simplicity to come to him as little children. I once had somebody ask me, what about somebody with Down syndrome? Can they understand the gospel? My goodness. Hallelujah. My goodness. I think many of them understand much better than the intellectuals. Because God is not limited by intellectual faculty and ability. Oh, hallelujah. The Holy Spirit certainly utilizes and will quicken, and, and as I shared, and he will, he will give gifts to men. But, but it's the heart that's always going to be the seat of your life. We need to be more concerned about how I'm coming to the Lord in my study than I am, will I understand it? The Holy Spirit, you're going to hear today, will bring understanding. There are things that I understand in Jesus that I cannot communicate because I would fail to express it. But later, God gives ability to now put language to it. Amen? Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, the Apostle Paul is praying. Let's go to verse 15, rather. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? In Matthew, Jesus said, when asked what is the greatest commandment, he said the first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. The Shema in Hebrew from Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5, that's what Jesus was quoting. And then what did he say? The the second one is like, like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two, all the laws of the prophets are um, recognized or, or represented. Look, therefore, also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's like commandment number one, and your love for all the saints. Isn't that beautiful? Vertical and horizontal. Something good is happening in Ephesus. <clears throat> Verse 16, do not cease to give thanks for you. Making mention of you in my prayers. The Apostle Paul constantly is thanking God for the Ephesian believers. Isn't it beautiful that, that they're on his mind all the time? He's constantly making mention of them in his prayers. Look at what he's praying for them. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? Hallelujah. May give to you the what? May give to you. Somebody say give. Paul understood being very smart himself, an intellectual himself, studying as a Pharisee, studied under Gamaliel, very educated man, very much a scholar, may give to you the spirit of wisdom. And when I say scholar, I'm not necessarily speaking the way it is today. But may give you, give you, give you, give you, not earn. He didn't say that you may study really hard and hope to intellectually understand. But that the spirit may what? The, that, that may give you to you the spirit of what? The spirit of wisdom. We need wisdom. Do you want to be at peace? You need wisdom. If if you and I want to be at peace, we need wisdom. We need the spirit of wisdom. We need the spirit of wisdom. We're not going to be at peace until we live with skill. The Hebrew mindset concerning wisdom is to live life with skill. To give you the spirit of wisdom and what? Revelation is revealed knowledge. It is not figured out. 
It is not like an earthly understanding. It is so unobtainable that God has to give it to us. Oh, that's good. The knowledge of God is so unobtainable, we cannot figure out the, through study, I'm going to understand God. I'm going to figure out God. Praise God. So what do you want? You want to be given the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of what? You see how specific this is? Oh, hallelujah. It's okay. It's okay. If you ever have grown up Christian and you grew up in a home, a denomination, a certain Christian background, um, or you're very, very well studied, or you're very, very smart, you, have a, you know a lot of things about a lot of topics, it's okay. You could just like get rid of all of it. If you want a mind of peace. Now, I'm not saying you'd get rid of it and never consult it, right? Like, don't walk around like a, like a dum-dum, right? But I am saying that when you want to seek peace, peace is not found in the wisdom of men. Peace is not found in knowledge. If peace was found in knowledge, we have more knowledge than we've ever had in any generation. We should therefore be more peaceful than any generation. We're not. In fact, it may arguably be said that we have more knowledge of our problem and therefore are more stressed than ever in any other generation. Mm. Before, you used to be able to feel a pain in your body and just not know much about it. And today, many were laughing. I don't know if it was this service or the, la the, the, last, the second service last week or whatever. I said, now you Google an ache in your hip and you'll find out you're dying tomorrow. <laughs> Billions of things come up of all the problems it could be. Why don't billions of solutions come? But Paul says, we can be given the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Can't find Jesus in Google. I mean, you can see some information about him, but a lot of it's wrong. Some things will be correct, some things won't be. The man who introduced me to Jesus Christ, the man who took me uh, under his wing and, and helped to disciple me, and to this day he's a spiritual dad, he told me something the very first day. He said, if you want to know God, don't ask man. He said, ask God. Isn't that beautiful? It's kind of a theme of his message today. If you really want to know God, the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, the revelation of God, you're going to automatically begin entering a realm of peace. What did I just say? A realm. Did I just use that word? Ooh. Realm. What's that? Is that new agey? No, it's not. A realms are very, 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 very real things. A realm is a, it's like a different operation. It's a whole different uh, Realm, I don't know how to describe it. It's a whole nother, here's one of those things you know, but it's difficult to explain. A realm, um, how would you describe this? Like there's an earthly realm and a heavenly realm, and it's in the scripture everywhere. In the beginnings, God created the heavens and the earth, and it's as if they're symbolically on the earth showing the difference, but there's the heaven in heaven, the third heaven, and it's a different realm, different, different rules, different, different everything. For example, you can grow in development in the earth, right, and in intellect, and get degrees, and you're, you're increasing in levels of complexity in the earth realm. You can enter the realm of the spirit of God, and you're just a little baby, In the earth, um, the more sophisticated you get, the more, um, the more uh, respect you get. In the, in the kingdom of God, the more you are like a child, 
the more honor you're receiving. If you exalt yourself on, on Facebook or TikTok or any of that junk, wow, look at that person. But the Bible says if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God in due time, Christ will exalt you. Wow, different. The last will be first and the first will be last is a communication that there is a change and a difference in how the realms. The human beings judged uh, uh, King Saul. He was very tall, good-looking guy. They judged him on the outward. God judges the heart. So these two different realms are very important. And what you're seeing in this verse is to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him means that we need to be given the information in order to perceive the other realm. So in these two realms, I don't want to speak too much about realms. It's not the purpose of the message today. But I will tell you that they're, they're so different. Just think of it like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy realm come, thy kingdom. Did you, did you get it? Thy kingdom come, thy what? Will be done. When Jesus said the kingdom of God has come to you, he said, uh, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, heal the sick, tell them the kingdom of God has come upon you. Why? In the realm of God's authority and kingdom where there is righteousness and holiness, it is casting out the other kingdom. The kingdom of God comes, it casts out the bondage, the sicknesses, and the disease. Disease and sickness and uh, anxiety are living and thriving in the realm that is fallen. So your old mind and your old nature are operating in a realm that is fallen. But when you got saved, we were singing it. I am who you say I am. I'm seated with you. In where? Oh, very good. In heavenly places. This is found in scripture. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. It's a realm. It's a heavenly kingdom realm. Praise God. We're actually truly seated there. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So it says here, we need to receive it. Everybody got it? Amen. Our blessing is living in the kingdom. Let thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Let thy will be done in this realm just as it is done in the heavenly realm. Thank you, Jesus. When we are worshiping God, whether it's through thanksgiving or whether it's through <coughs> sharing a testimony or it's with song, we are often entering a different realm. Did anybody experience a shift in the environment during worship today? You know what's literally happening? This is so much fun to talk about. You know, it's so much fun. You know what's literally happening is it's not just an emotion. It's actually beginning to become aware. Now, let, I, I need to say it like that because it's not like God isn't here. The whole earth is full of his glory. Hallelujah. But we're becoming what? Aware. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you know how many angels are often all around us protecting us, how much love, how the Holy Spirit's living within you, but usually we're unaware, so we're afraid. In 2 Kings, Elisha is, is there, was Elijah or Elisha, there are more against us, more for us than against us? Elisha, right? Yeah. And so he's there in 2 Kings, I believe it's chapter 6. And the Syrian army is all around them. And Elijah wakes up and the servant is so afraid. This is terrible. The enemy's all around us. 
And then Elisha prays, God, open his eyes. Let him see. Hallelujah. And what it, there's more, many, many more. The army of God was many more and they were there. But the difference was not the coming of the power of God or the army of God. It was the servant became aware. What do you think is going to happen to our anxiety when we become aware of how much God is with us? I, I need your help. Why do you worry? What? How do you sing it? Yeah, help me. <laughs> God knows what I, why do I worry? God knows what I need. I'm making my new song. Right? <laughs> why do we worry? Because we're unaware. We're unaware. Jesus Christ He's already dead. His blood already spilled. His body already broken. He's already died. He's already been buried. He's already been, come on, resurrected from the dead. He's already at the seated at the right hand of the Father. He's already given us promises. There are thousands of promises which are all yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, may you receive the spirit of wisdom and reveal knowledge of him. Because when you do, you don't just see him. You see every promise that in him thousands are in the scripture thousands of promises are yes and amen in Jesus and what are we doing worried yet we are seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly places right now if you are a believer you're seated with I don't know if you understand what that means Kings sat down means their work is finished. Victorious. And guess where we're seated? With the king. Where's Jesus? The Bible says at the right hand of the Father. Where are we? Seated with him. What about the authority we were speaking about? How's that bridge go? When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority. Jesus has given it to me. You think I wasn't on the darn worship team. People think those are words. It's a declaration of the aware. Why do you worry? God knows what you need. <laughs> the Bible says that the Father knows that we, what we need even before we yes. ask him. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. So there is a shifting that's happening in the heart of a believer that says, I'm going to study so I can learn by figuring it out. No. No, it's very burdensome to do that. You wind up utilizing only your mind. But if you would come to the Word of God and you would say, Lord, I am going to study hard diligently. I am going to read. I am going to get into the text. I am going to do it deeply so that you may reveal the meaning to me. Did you get it? The hard work never changed. It's not like, well, I can't figure it out. Pastor said that I can't figure it out, so God just give it to me. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying to study, to show yourself approved, that you'll be good work, workers of the, uh, of the Lord who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We got to study our you-know-what off. But we don't get the knowledge because we earned it. We're presenting, we're seeking it out. We're, we're knocking, we're seeking, we're, 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 we're asking, we're seeking, we're knocking so that the Lord can open the door. Oh, hallelujah. Is this making sense? So at the end of the day, this is why one verse, one verse, we can spend an hour, two, three, four, five hours on one verse. 
praying through it, studying it, seeking, where it, how does that fit the Bible? Praise God. I'm going to be uh, traveling and being with a bunch of pastors, and, and uh, we're going to be uh, digging into Psalm 23. Six verses are in Psalm 23. We're spending multiple days just on one psalm, just six verses, exegeting those verses deeply. Some people say, how boring is that? <laughs> no, you bring, you bring people that are on their knees as a lifestyle, and what are they showing? They're now revealing what the spirit of wisdom and revelation have shown them. Amen? Look, you could easily go to the internet. I could go to the internet, and, and you know, when, when I'm presenting about Psalm 23 soon, and I'm going to present it, and I can say, here's all the facts. It'll move nobody. But if I can share, wow, this means something. Why is a king preparing a table? Wow. Come on. Wherever in history does a lord become a shepherd? Yes. Why does a lord shepherd us to a table? Why am I seated at a table in the presence of my enemies? Ooh, Father. I thought deliverance means he did away with the enemies. Why are they still there? I can barely hold it back. <laughs> Do you know what it means that you're seated? What are you eating at the table? What is the, what is the cup? Has anybody ever heard that? You, it, can you put up Psalm 23, please? Yeah. Verse 6? No, I'm sorry, verse 5. You see, God is desiring to reveal to his sons and daughters. Wow. Every one of you got to break a lie that says, I can't understand. You can understand because he enables you to understand. Yes, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You prepare a table before me in the presence of God. No, it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say that at all. Does it? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What do you think that means? Oh, my goodness. Where did he just come from? He came from the valley of the shadow of death, didn't he? He wasn't going to fear any evil, was he? Somehow, he's walking in the valley of the shadow of death, and there's enemies all around him, and now he's eating at a table with enemies all around him. What do you think is a bigger victory? Running from the enemy and finding yourself safe? Or being able to leisurely dine in a way that they can see you and they can't do a, a about it? Come on. What level of authority would you be in the presence of your enemies that you're dining Ooh. and resting, Ooh. seated at a table, and your enemies are right there. You have no fear. They have, there is no threat. There is nothing. God is communicating something deeper than we understand. And what do we do? Uh, here's, here's a plastic. Uh, can I have one of those things? No, no, no. I'm sorry. The communion element? Yeah. Thank you, my brother. Well, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. So you see this thing? That's what it's been reduced to. People come into a church service and what do they find? Oh, that's cool. Until you begin to get into God revealing something that represents a table that you're in the presence of your enemies. I don't know how you can have anxiety eating at a table prepared by a king. Our anxiety is no match for the meal. Our anxiety has no match for the meal. I'm going to be preaching about the meal a lot. We're going to find that even our house church gatherings, the meal was at the center of the gathering in the, lo in the local church, in the early church. It was at the center. It wasn't a, hey, let's have a few hors d'oeuvres. 
there was something deep about entering the environment where the body and blood of Jesus was becoming remembered. See, people say, I, teach me how to overcome anxiety, and then they go to all the anxiety overcoming verses, right? Like, show me all the peace verses. That's good. But that's not going to come up in your Google search. Are, are you getting where I'm going? Because you have to get into the understanding of the revelation that you're seated at a table in the presence of your enemies. Because David is testifying, you anoint my head. You anoint my head. Do you know that you can have an anointed head? It's talking about the authority. You're anointing, but also where's your brain? Where's your head? Where are you living from? And it rolls all the way down. But the head is actually in the heart. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. My cup. Do you know what this is revealing about God? You drink a little bit, he pours more. He drink, he pour more. Drink a little bit, you pour more. Did you ever go to a restaurant where it's like free refills? And you had a salty meal, and you're thirsty. And you down that iced tea, and you're waiting for that waiter to come to refill your cup. Now you're halfway through your meal, and you're thirstier. And you still don't get a refill. So you start going like this, trying to get their attention. I want you to know that the meal at the table of God, you will never encounter an empty cup. Hallelujah. You will never encounter it. Oh, somebody says, yeah, yeah, but I've been disobeying God. While you're disobeying, he's pouring what you need. The blood was meant for those who sin. The blood was meant for the, the bread was meant for those who are weak. So, oh, hallelujah. Isn't it powerful that is, you, you say, Pastor, where is that in Scripture? Well, it's in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says that Christ died for the ungodly when we were still yet sinners. He was preparing the table in the heavenly realm. While we didn't even know his name. While we didn't even know we were dead in sin. God already put it in place. Can you put up Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Thank you Lord. My Lord, my, my, my Lord. All right, we're going to go to uh, chapter 3, verse 15 in Genesis. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is a prophecy. When, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, we see a prophecy emerge. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is speaking about Jesus Bruising the head of Satan and Satan only bruising the heel of Jesus. Jesus is going to break the authority of Satan, but the crucifixion is only going to be breaking the heel, the furthest place from the authority of God. Satan never can break the authority of God. Hallelujah! This is a prophecy about the cross. But until the Savior comes, can you put up uh, chapter 3, verse 21? Until the Savior comes, there's grace. And he says what? Same chapter. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Wow, this is very, very powerful. Again, I'm not going to teach all this now, 
But what did Adam and Eve make when they fell and they hid from God? Last week I shared, they made fig leaves, right? That was their own work, right? Right? So they tried to cover themselves with their own work, their own resources, and they covered themselves with fig leaves. It didn't work. God gives a prophecy. I got a solution. I have a plan in place that I'm going to take down this dragon. I'm going to take down this serpent. I'm going to destroy him, and there's going to be a time when human beings will be restored back to their authority, back to their purpose. But until then, what does he do? God performs the first animal sacrifice. A lot of people don't know about this. They thought it originated when the Jews began sacrificing. They're only doing that because God is saying there is no covering, no atonement without blood. Oh, hallelujah. Fig leaves were earned. The, tunic, the tunics of skin were given. Peace does not get earned. It gets received. By receiving what Jesus has done. Yep, I know. Again, sounds so basic, right? We've heard it before, but not that basic because we haven't got there yet. So we have to drink and eat at the table. Praise God. Look at uh, James with me, chapter 1. We also took a look at this. James chapter 1. Many people know this text. At least they know this part of the text. Verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Remember, we were, we were dancing last week about that. And I had shared that it's not dancing and rejoicing because you have problems. It's rather rejoicing because you've read the rest of the text. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. But that, that you may be perfect and what? Complete, what? Lacking nothing. Ah, remember Shalom? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Do you, do you get that? Wait, you need the spirit of wisdom. If anybody lacks wisdom, what do you do? You ask God. Don't ask man. Now, you can ask men and women who know God. But ultimately, still, that's not the place that God's saying to go. You ask God, because as you're asking God, now you're able to communicate with God, and other people can assist you in your journey, but they should not be the source. If, like the Sunday preaching and, and the, uh, the, the house church study during the week should not actually be your primary source of learning. Oh, somebody's got to hear that, because that's happening all the time. Not in the Bible, not studying, not going to God yourself, and then you go and listen to other people's faith. If any of you lacks wisdom, what do you do? You ask. You ask. Let him ask of God. And what, what about God? He gives liberally without reproach. Your cup is overflowing. Come on. Come on. So there's a lot of people who don't have wisdom because they haven't asked. And their cup is empty because they haven't asked. Who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will what? Given. It'll be what? Given. 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 Ask. Given. That Paul was praying that, the, that they would be given. That they would be what? Given. The spirit of wisdom. The spirit of revelation. But the problem is, wherever there is pride, it's difficult to receive. Wherever there is doubt, it's difficult to receive. Wherever there is resistance to what Jesus has done, it's difficult to receive. So those people who don't receive start questioning the one who's trying to give. And they say things like, how come God hasn't? Because they're dealing with the lack. So if, if, if your faith is not 
alive, if your faith is not directed toward God or your prideful, and by the way, most of us don't even recognize our own pride. The stuff that God tells me about my pride is not like, oh, I, I, I am, I'm the best. Yep. Doesn't matter what you say. I'm the, it doesn't often manifest that way. But here's where it does manifest. We don't pray. That reveals pride. I don't need God. I'm not dependent on God. You ready this? We don't hear the word. We read it. We don't hear it. We read it, but we don't receive it. We read it, but we don't actually take it in. It's pride. I, I know something, and I'm not, I'm not going to yield to the word of God. Do we, do, we, do we wake up in the morning and say that? Rarely. Rarely. It more just kind of happens where the word of God is coming, and it just, whew, it's not penetrating the heart. What about this one? This even gets worse. It gets escalated. We, we know what we're supposed to do, and we don't do it. This is when people say, I know I shouldn't say this, but... That is, oh, oh, no, don't do that. If you know you shouldn't, then yield to it. You're resisting the wisdom of God. But those who really want the wisdom of God, man, it just seems to flood to them, and it will be given to him. But look, look, look what it says now later. Verse number six, but let him ask in what? With faith. With what? No doubting. Now let's discuss the person who's doubting. For he who doubts is what? Like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Has anybody ever seen a little wave driven and tossed by the wind, right? It's all over the place. In fact, you can't even keep your eye on one thing, right? It's just all over there. But let him ask in faith with what? No doubting. It doesn't say let him ask in faith with little doubting. It says let him ask in faith with what? No doubting. Somebody say no doubting. No doubting. Now, some people may be saying, how am I going to do that? Well, that just reveals to you that you're, wor you're working with your carnal mind. Because the mind of the spirit already is actually believing God. Your born again spirits, our born again spirits, can't wait till we allow ourselves to live by them. Number seven, please. For let not that man suppose that he will receive. Why? Go ahead, verse eight. He is a. Oh, there's the revelation now. He's double-minded, which means he has two minds. One carnal, fallen, corrupt, the other spiritual. And he's unstable in all his ways. So the text brought us from wisdom to praying for wisdom to revealing that whenever we're praying for something, if we have two minds, it's not working. So we need to have not one part of us in earth realm and another part of us in heavenly realm and pray. <laughs> Has anybody ever heard of the word division? Yes. It comes from die, meaning two vision, two visions. One part of yourself, your, your, the, one, the part that you're no longer, the one that's dead, the ones that are crucified... It's thinking things out of doubt and fear and anxiety. The other one is believing God. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, put off the old man. Put on the new man. It's an illustration like stop operating according to the old, which is corrupt. So there's only one way to be able to fix this. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, there's many there's many contributing things you may do in your life, but there's one fundamental way. You crucify one, and you live by the other. Oh, so good. Okay? You, 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 don't, you, you don't have a wrestling match. You crucify one, and you live by the other. Now, let me help you understand this. So we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and re-pick up the text that Paul was preaching to the Greeks. Remember, they had Greek minds and they had Roman type minds, right? And, uh, and then there's the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. So we're going to be, I can't finish all this today, but we're going to be developing of how to operate in a mind that isn't ours. 
by earned effort. It's ours because someone else's mind has been given to us. Oh my gosh. It's ours. We have the mind of Christ, but it wasn't earned. It was given as a sacrifice. I don't know if people preach about this much. We got his blood, but we didn't get his mind. When you got made like him, you became as him. Now, don't think I've mastered this in my life. I'm still getting sanctified and working on this stuff myself. But what we're doing is we're identifying what has been given to us. Here's not the gospel. You get saved by the grace of God, and then you live the rest of your life through your own effort and works. Nope. You get saved by grace. You live by grace. You think through grace. You pray in grace. You have your whole being by him. You move and have your being because of him. When uh, Sister Jackie was testifying today about the Lord's healing in her body, and she said, don't worry, she's testifying, why do you worry? God is not worried. He knows what you need. Hallelujah. So she, listen, ah, oh, Jesus, I got too many things in my head at the same time. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 1, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What did he pray for Ephesus? That you may have the revelation of the knowledge of him. Now he's declaring, I'm operating in that revelation. You get it? I got what I'm praying you move in. All right? I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in what? Demonstration of what? So he's declaring right there, I'm not coming to you like the Greeks. I'm not coming to you like the Romans. I'm coming to you like a man who was given the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I'm coming to you with the knowledge of Jesus. Now, you walk up to most people, right? Oh, man, this is funny. You walk up to most people and you say, I would like to discuss the solution to your problem. And they say, what is it? Well, I will bring you the wisdom and the revelation of the knowledge of him. I'll talk to you all about Jesus. And what do most people do? Shut down right there. Do you ever wonder why? Why? You think it's just human? No. Satan knows. You think like a Greek? I'll keep you bound. You think like a Roman? I'll keep you bound. You think like Jesus? I can't contend with his authority. Come on, come on. I can't keep you bound. Why do you think the devil doesn't want you in a house church? Yes. I'm too busy. You're too busy to get blessed? Come on. You're too busy to get the wisdom of God? Come on. No. You're too busy? You're not too busy. We may be busy, but not too busy. Can I tell you something, though? I was with somebody uh, in a doctor's waiting room, and I was there to support them and help them. And maybe this has happened to you or a loved one that you know, and you go there, and you make an appointment for 10 o'clock a.m., and they tell you to be 15 minutes early to fill out all their paperwork. And you get there, and you park. you got to leave early, and you're diligent because you're in pain, and you got a problem. Somehow all your priorities change because you have a problem. Now you have the time to make a doctor's appointment to go see the wisdom of men. And now you go and you leave early. And by the way, you needed to fast because you need to have a uh, contrasting image, you know, an MRI or a CAT scan or something. And so you couldn't even eat. So now you're even willing to fast. But you also said that you weren't able to fast because you get headaches. And it was really hard. But now that the doctor asked you, you come under the authority of the doctor and you say, uh, yes, I will fast and I'm going to drink because let, let me tell you, you not only not have to eat, you got, listen, I've drank barium before. 
oh. When I had cancer, I, I had a drink. I, oh. Oh. Let me leave that. I got that too much image in my brain now. And, uh, but you'll do it. Yeah. Why? Because you have a problem. And you're seeking the solution. So you go there for your 10 a.m. appointment, but you show up at 9.45 and you fill out all the paperwork. And then you give your credit card and the insurance because you're going to pay more than you've ever paid the church or tithe or God honoring them. You're not going to go into debt because you got a problem. And you got no problem going into debt and you got no problem paying for an insurance that you can barely afford because you got a problem. So now you've given time and money, the very two things you said you couldn't give to God. My God. But because you didn't give them to God, now you're going to give them to men, people you never met before. Oh, God. Now you're, you're at your 10 a.m. appointment, and now 45 minutes passes, and nobody in the waiting room has moved. Anybody ever been there before, right? And then finally, you get to see the people coming out, and they're not smiling. You ever been in the, in the waiting room? And people come out of the door, you know, and they're cut like this. I wonder what happened in that meeting. So you wait longer and an hour goes by and finally they say, we'll see you. And here's the good news. You get in a room and there's no doctor in there yet. Then they poke, they prob, they test this. I know you're laughing. They test this, they test this, they test that. Finally, the doctor comes in with a white coat. And then you hope that you're going to get something, and then you say thank you to the doctor for your hour wait, the extra exorbitant payment you have to give, the fasting, the bar and you go through all this stuff. And I'm not making fun of it, but I'm bringing it to light. Because somehow you had time and a will, and you were willing. And then you go through that, and now you're in debt because of the medical expenses, and you're still thanking the doctor when the surgery didn't even work. Could you go to him again for another help? I'm not aiming to put doctors down. That's not my aim. My aim is to say what would happen if we gave God the time, and what would happen if we got his wisdom what would happen if I prioritized and sought him and his kingdom, his realm, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things will be added to you? Maybe we'd be in a position to move in the authority of the meal called the body and blood of Jesus so that we could pray because I have received the revelation of how to overcome. Maybe it would be different. Because that help the doctor's giving is so wonderful and beautiful. Many times, many times not good, but many times it's so good for good doctors, right? Doing, trying to really help people. But I can't, I can't, I can't help but be there when I'm, I'm there with somebody and say, what do I do? What do I do? They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. I'm not blaming them. They don't know. Nobody told them that somebody died for them. Nobody told them that the authority of sickness and disease has been broken. Nobody shared with them that there's another way. And then the believer is there when the believer could be operating in a higher grace. So if you would ask me, you know, is our doctors and medicine part of a type of grace? Well, yes. Because that's often holding our flesh bodies on the earth longer. But if you'd ask me, is that the solution of the wisdom of God? I would say no. Come on. Come on. So it, it may be a help, an assistance to treat pain. But is that what God sent from his realm? Did he send a pharmacist? No offense to the pharmacies. Did, did he send doctors? No offense to the doctors. He sent Someone to bleed. Jesus. But that doesn't make any sense to the carnal mind. And people love to point out, Pastor, you're, you're preaching unbalanced. You're telling people not to go to the doctor. I never said that. 
I'm not telling you what not to do. I'm telling you, if you add to anything in your life, seek Jesus, seek his wisdom, Amen. seek his word, get his mind, because the thing you're afraid of, he's not afraid of. Get his mind. The thing the doctor said, nothing we can do. Get his mind. He said, oh, that's no problem. You should have seen Lazarus. Somebody says, oh, but I'm getting old and all this stuff's breaking. God says, I'll renew your strength like the eagles. Get his mind. Somebody says, God, I don't have any money. God says, I have plenty of money. I don't get his mind. God, I don't have money. I'm a provider. Get his mind. You're thinking, you're thinking of all the scientists and medicine and lawyers and doctors and all the, 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 the amazing people. Why did God send a silent lamb? For all that he knows, he knows everything about the earth. Jesus does not know when the Father is the end days. The, but anyway, God knows. And for everything he knows, he sends a lamb silent before its shearer. Humble, meek, pliable. They beat him. They pull the hairs of his beard out of his face. They put a crown of thorns on him. He's silent. They spear him on the cross. They beat him. They spit on him. And he's silent. This is not the wisdom of men. I'm not telling you that you're sinners by going to a doctor. I am not telling you that you should not go to a doctor. I am telling you there is a higher, deeper, wider, more powerful love of grace that if we would flow in it, we would not need to have the help of men the way we think we would. I cannot imagine going to Jesus and saying, Lord, I need your help. He says, hold on, I know a good physician. He says, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. But you must ask him, Lord, I need your mind. Yes, son, you need my mind because you're trying to figure me out. You're trying to understand me. But the Bible knows that we would try. And it says, rather than yield. This one, the Lord looks after. The one who trembles at his word. I want to tell you that it can be tough when you are trying to pursue God and things aren't working. I understand. You're trying to pray and it doesn't seem like it's going to break through. You're trying to pursue and you're getting discouraged and it's not changing and you're wondering why. I tell you, you got to get his mind. you got to get his mind because when you get his mind, you get his heart. And when you get his heart and mind, you get God. And when you are thinking and moving and having your being according to what he says and how he thinks and what he has done, there's going to be agreement between you on earth and him on his throne. And power comes in that moment. Power comes at that moment. But while we are misaligned, while we are thinking this, and he's trying to give us his son, and we're giving this, and he's giving this, and how can two walk together unless they agree? How can they be together unless they agree? How can they be together unless they agree? Why did John G. Lake lay hands Under, underneath a microscope, the, the, the whatever thing they did, the leg, the leg was all messed up and broken. He places his hands in the hospital 